from the 12th chapter of Genesis, just the first through the third verses. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the word of the Lord and we give thanks for it. Amen. Wednesday night, I got to preach in a Lutheran church. And if you've ever been in a lot of the big Lutheran churches, they have these really high elevated pulpits. So I was like 25 feet above everyone. Felt kind of nice. But anyway, (laughs) so I've been brought back down to my, my one foot here. That's good. I need brought down a lot. (laughs) Brothers and sisters, as we come together this day, we're going to take a journey through this Advent season, as it is always a journey, but as we come through our sermons, we're going to focus on looking at some of the prophecies in the Bible that Jesus fulfills, and exactly what this season means. Christmas is not just something that happened out of the blue that just fell out of nowhere, but rather it's part of the plan that God had set forth And we see that because of all the scriptures in the Old Testament, all the ways that everything that we have in the Bible leads up to this moment when God came down to dwell amongst us. And what does that mean for our faith? What does that mean for our celebration of that season? How do we find the hope, joy, peace, and love of Christmas through understanding who exactly Jesus was? And so I want to start out today by looking at this scripture in Genesis Where Abram is told by God, I will make of you a great nation and you will be a blessing to the world. I will curse those who curse you and by you all nations of the world will be blessed. So I think this is one of the first prophecies we get that points to Jesus' coming. That Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy and that prophecy gives us hope. Now hope is an interesting thing, right? Because it all depends how we define hope, how we understand hope. We often think of hope in our world being a fickle thing that we can either have or we cannot have, and it goes really quickly from one to the other, right? I have an example for that from this week. So yesterday, we got to go and get the Salisbury family Christmas tree, right? And we're still live tree people, okay? That's the kind of people we are. We're better than you non-live tree people. All right. Todd's clap. It's all right. Wait till I get old. I'm, I'm already old. Anyway. All right. So we went to get our tree. And if you ask the girls where we went to get our tree, they'll tell you Arby's. So we went to Arby's to get our tree. And we got there. And an interesting thing happens every year when we get to go get our tree is my incredibly reasonable, logical wife all of a sudden forgets the dimensions of our home. Right? Because Heather has a fondness for fat, unkempt Christmas trees, right? Uh, I say she has the same cre- taste in trees that she has in men, right? <laughs> and, and so we see this tree, right? Just cut that day, beautiful tree, size of Montana, right? Huge. And, you know, it's like one of those like a Griswold family Christmas trees, right? Now, I had to clarify in the early service. This is not a picture of our car, right? This is from a movie, all right? But... We got a tree that was, frankly, too large for the space it was going in, right? So we had to move everything all around our living rooms as it takes up half the living room width-wise. We had to chop a bunch off the top so we could shove the angel on top, and she sort of had a bent angle, right, pressed up against the ceiling, okay? So that's where we have it, and but we got it in. I got it in. I muscled it in. It was in the stand. It's watered, decorated, lights, everything, right? So we're happy, and I step back, and I watched Heather's face, because Heather loves her trees, right? This is, the, this is the pinnacle of the beginning of the season for her, and the way I would describe it is it's just hope, right? 
You see this, this was this wonderful family tradition. Our children are finally able to actually decorate a tree without just breaking everything. It was a wonderful time, right? We felt great. We were in the Christmas spirit, and it was just such a hope-filled moment, right? It went the way we hoped. We had the tree we wanted. It was in, and it was great. And then then we went off, we went over to Rocky Ridge to see Christmas lights, and that went great. We came home, and we were just full bundles of hope, right? We walked in the house, and what do you think had happened? (laughs) Tree is down, all right? Now, now, here's the issue. So we have our three girls who don't respond well in crisis situations, right? All right? They just start screaming and running around, Okay? The dog is just excited everyone's home, so he's getting in everyone's way. And Heather, who's normally an incredibly helpful person in this moment, was not, right? Because all of that hope, right, all of that hope that we had experienced earlier was now gone, right? It was all dashed, right? Because she was convinced that all of our keepsake ornaments that we collect from wherever we gone were all crushed underneath the tree, Right? She was angry at herself for insisting on the fat Christmas tree that had now collapsed, right? And so she was just about to sob over in the corner, right? So it was all up to me to get the tree up, to get the rest of the tree back into position, to try to figure out whatever I had done in the first place to screw it up, right? So they get it to stand right. We had to reposition the ornaments and everything, but we finally got the tree back up. We got it to where it needs to be, and as, as of the time... I left this morning, it was still standing. When Heather and the girls left this morning, I asked last service, it was still standing. So we'll see what happens when we get home, okay? Now, the reason I share all that is, first of all, because you can probably relate to horrible things happening during the Christmas season with me. But secondly, I just can't think of a better way to express how much hope can be snatched away from you in this world, right? By the things of this world, you can be given lots of hope. There's joy to be found in this world. There's amazing things in this gift of a world that God has given to us. But there's also only so much this world can do, right? That it's easy to have something that can bring you a lot of hope and a lot of joy and all love and peace and all the things we have and and just have it taken away from you. And so when we talk about hope in the terms of our Advent wreath, when we talk about hope, hope in terms of our faith in Jesus Christ. We're talking about something that goes a lot deeper than what can be inspired by a beautifully lit and decorated tree. We're talking about something much deeper than what this world can provide for us. We're talking about a certainty that we have in our faith, a certainty that we have in the promises that God has laid out for us. That's what it means for us to hope, not for hope for something that might happen or something that might be fulfilled or something that can be taken away, but rather to have certainty in what will happen, in what God is going to give us. And we're able to do that because of stories like we read in Genesis here in Scripture, because we see, have seen how God's plan has been at work in our world. We see how God has fulfilled those promises time and time again. And so we know that when we hope in God, we hope in the certainty of the promises that are to come. Because God has a plan, right? Plans are important. If we don't fully plan, bad things can happen, right? There's a story I read in preparation for this sermon It was a story of a man in 1981 who decided he was going to go to northern Alaska, out where no one lives, and he was going to go for for a number of months and photograph um, wildlife and flora and fauna and all those sorts of things that I would have no interest in doing, right? And so he had all the supplies he needed. He brought all his all his film that he needed. He brought several firearms. He brought thousands of pounds of provisions, and a plane flew him up to northern Alaska and dropped him off, Okay. That was in the spring. By August, his diary entries had changed from being all of wonder and awe to being of horror, right? As he began to realize that he might have some problems. By November, he had died. He had died. And the reason he died was he had planned for everything. He had planned for all the things that he might need, for his protection, for his food, for everything he might need. The one thing he did not plan is on a plane to come back and get him, right? Plans aren't very useful if you don't plan the whole way through, right? You can plan the beginning and the middle. If you don't plan the end, 
it's not going to help, right? And so when we talk about Scripture, we have to understand that God has planned out all of these things, the beginning, the middle, and the end. That when God created the world, when we first turn, when God is talking to Abram here, he knows the journey that is to come. When he says, through you, this world will be blessed. Through your nation, this world will be blessed. Now that took a lot of weird turns, right? It didn't always look like God's promise was going to be true. Remember, we spent years and years and years enslaved in Egypt. We wandered around a desert for 40 years, right? We went through a bunch of horrible judges and horrible kings and a bunch of prophets coming down and yelling at everybody, right? But finally, we get to the gospel, right? We get to the gospel. God said, through you, through this nation, I will bless this world. Out of what nation is Jesus born? Israel, right? The people of Abram that God foretold. That comes to fruition in Jesus. And then most of the apostles, the early apostles of Jesus, who are going out and telling his story are what kind of people? Jewish, they're Hebrews, right? They're people who have been raised as part of this nation. And so this nation takes the word of Jesus, the salvation of the world, what the world has been waiting for, the hope of everything out into the world and the entire world. You people are blessed because of that promise that was made to Abram. That is God fulfilling promises. That is God's plan at work and reminds us that when God makes a promise, that God has a plan. When God spoke those words to Abram, he knew you would be here today. When God spoke those words to Abram, he knew my Christmas tree was going to fall down yesterday, right? God has a plan. I don't know if it's in God's plan for my tree to fall down, but it gave me something to tell you today, so maybe it was, right? Right? And now we have the tree turned and it actually looks better than it did the first time. So there, right? There is a plan that God has for this world that he lived out and showed us in Christ Jesus coming down, right? That is God's plan for the world and reminds us that when God makes us a promise, when God promises you that salvation, that salvation and eternal life is inherent in Jesus Christ, you know that promise to be true because God has kept his promises. And so when we come to that time in our lives and we place our hope in Jesus, it isn't just this sweet hope that maybe that'll be true, but we know it to be true because God's promises are true true so God has a plan for this world my friends God doesn't only have a plan for this world we know that God has a plan for each and every one of our lives right we talked earlier about how we plan things right how many of you here would consider yourselves planners right that need to plan something right okay and there's some of us that just fly by the seat of our pants right there's a spectrum okay now, you might have noticed when you came in today that everything is decked out for Christmas, right? In the church here, right? It's decorated. This is pretty much all, other than the crash here, you know, the crash family. But other than that, it is all done by Jennifer Zach, right? Jennifer came in here in a whirlwind and set everything up, okay? And then any of you who have spent time with Jennifer will not be shocked that she gave Dwayne a large manuscript explaining exactly where everything needed to be plugged in and exactly how everything needed to be turned on and when it needed to be done. That's planning, right? That's planning. Now, those of you who are planners can also say that almost always when you plan to do something, what do you know is going to happen? It's not going to work, right? You know something is going to go wrong, right? That's what tends to happen with our plans. Something needs to go wrong. Now, Dwayne was so amazing that, look, it all lit up. It did what it was supposed to. But we know that often, no matter how well we try to plan, no matter what we try to put into place, things tend to go wrong. And we need to be prepared for that. Now, I'm not telling you today not to plan, right? It's important for us to plan in our lives, to try to be prepared so, again, we can be the best examples and the best disciples of Christ that we can be. But we also need to come to terms with the fact that our lives are not going to go by our plans, 
but rather that they're going to go according to God's plan. And we might not always like the way that that plan goes, right? That plan might take a lot of twists and turns and detours that we never expected, right? We see that in the Old Testament, right? There's a whole lot of stuff that happens between Genesis 12 and Matthew, right? If you've ever read through it, there's a lot that goes on that doesn't seem like it's leading the right way. And yet God's plan gets them where they need to go. God's plan will get you where you need to go. Maybe it's even worse. Maybe you're at one of those moments you come across in your life where you don't know what the plan is. You don't know what lays ahead. You don't know what's coming next. Right? One of those moments that if we're watching a movie or a show or, a, or reading a book and we get to the end, have you ever had one that ends on what they call a cliffhanger? Right? This is terrifying picture of a cliffhanger but right where you can't wait to pick up the next thing or watch the next episode or get the next movie because you need to know what happened right what happened to the characters what's going to go on my eldest daughter just went through this a few months ago we had a showing here at the movie of the pilgrim's progress right the movie and the story and she came and she watched the movie with her sisters and you get to the end of the movie and it's a wonderful ending except they say well, maybe the family of the man who was saved might start their journey to go find him. And Joanne, after the movie, she says, that's great, but I want to hear what happens to the family. Where, when can we watch the next one? I had to tell her, I said, first of all, I don't know if there's going to be a next one. Secondly, this one took six years to make. So it's probably going to be a while. And she was horror stricken because she was said, what? happens i need to know what happens to those people are they saved are they not saved what happens to them we can't stand sometimes the not knowing that's even worse than when we're in one of those detours or one of those valleys in our lives sometimes it's just the not knowing what's laying ahead not having that plan we want to know but my friends what the hope of this season's about is realizing that no matter what lays ahead and I promise you, look, my tree fell down and we're on December 1st, right? I promise you stuff's going to go wrong over the next few weeks in your life. Problem, maybe it might be a lot more serious than a tree falling down. But no matter what happens, God's with you. God has a plan for your life. And no matter where it goes, if you keep your faith, you're going to end where you need to be. You're going to end with the Lord you're going to be there because God's promises are true. That's what the hope of the Christmas season means. That's the hope that we have that the world can't take away from us, that the world can't get rid of because it's a hope that is sure and true and the God who has answered those promises time and time again. And that's what the celebration of Christmas is. That's what the celebration of the manger is. As Christ came down, God kept his word. And God will keep his promise in your life as well. And so my friends, my only other ask, my only other challenge to you would be don't keep the hope that you have to yourself. We just finished a sermon series all about evangelism without being weird, right? And last week, I issued a challenge to everyone. I said to go out and to do what? Those of you who are here. What did I tell you to do? Invite someone. Invite someone to church or to something or to something else. All right? Now, I noticed that you know, we had less people here in church today. I'm not sure if that's because of the weather or because I guess through that challenge, I don't want them to show up. All right? Even if you invite someone, they got a good excuse for this Sunday, right? Eh, the weather is bad. I ain't want to come out, but I'll come out some other time. So, my friends, don't let that challenge die, right? If that's something you didn't get the opportunity to do, that's okay. It's another week. It's another opportunity. But there are so many people in this world who this season, the greatest hope they might have in life is from a lighted tree. The greatest hope they have in life is something that can be taken away or they might not have that hope at all. You know true hope and certainty in Christ Jesus. Reach out into the world. Invite people to come. Invite people to come and know the hope, the peace, the joy, and the love that only Christ Jesus can bring. 
And together we can bring light to a dark world. We can bring hope to the hopeless. So brothers and sisters, would you bow your heads, would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, I thank you for my friends. I thank you for, Lord, I thank you for this season, this time of celebration. I ask Lord, that our lives will be filled with the light that only you can provide. And so, Lord, as we come into this season, I just, uh, just ask that you inspire us, transform us, mold us, Lord, that when we celebrate your arrival, when we come together, Lord, on Christmas Eve, that we would be ready, ready to be changed and transformed. For we are your people. And, Lord, we are part of your amazing plan for this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.